Welcome to episode number 65 of About the Cards podcast live tonight on YouTube. As always, with me, my host, Stefan LaFleur, I drive Wax Twins. Oh, hi. Ben Wilson at our trading cards, and I'm Big Shep 79, Tim Shepler. We are a podcast by collectors for collectors, and we hope to bring you a smart and insightful podcast about trading card collecting. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific, 10 Central. 10 Central. Yes. Uh, you can always find us on YouTube, Periscope, and Facebook Live. And uh, check us out there. And then you always follow us on Twitter at About the Cards. We're available as a podcast on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, Overcast, TuneIn, kind of wherever you can listen to a podcast. You will see us and find us, which is great. Uh, check out our website, aboutthecards.wordpress.com. And we also have, if you want to buy some swag, uh, we have it on. Uh, we have that available for you, too. And that's on Spreadshirt.com. Just search About the Cards. Good after, good evening, fellas. How's uh, your week been of collecting? Rather long, uh, c- c- busy, but uh, I, I can't, I can't complain. Cannot speak either. Apparently. How about you, Benjamin? Uh not much has gone on. I was actually excited. I got the last uh, Tops Fire insert that I needed. I. I uh, they had three in Fuego, which were a little harder to come by, and I finally was able to get the base Ricky Henderson. So I actually have uh, the base set of the gold minted and the blue chips. So I was pretty excited. Plus, it fills out a whole page, which is kind of neat. Oh, nice! That's fun. I, I uh, finished my Giants tops um, collation from fifty, the San Francisco Giants. So from fifty-eight through nineteen, uh, and I have my completed one. Which is available at bigshipcards.com. Uh, uh, and you know, it's not very extensive. Most of it's from 58 through about 76, 77. So uh, I'm excited. I was happy to get that done. Now it's on to Donneris and Fleer and Score and Upper Deck and some of the other fun ones. And then to, then to get back into the Royal stuff. So uh, I'm wearing my Braves hat tonight because you know they won the division. They're going to win the World Series. I'm letting you know right now on August or on uh, September 18th, uh, they are going to win the World Series. You think so? Yeah. To, to your point about the Giants, it's always nice when you can complete a run of whatever it is. Um, obviously, I don't expect you to go back a whole lot further with the Giants. You know, into the New York days, since. Uh, one particular player is going to make that quite costly. Yeah, that, that's why I say with San Francisco Giants. Yeah. Well, especially yeah. if it's not your your main team either. I mean, obviously, you being a Royals fan, Giants being secondary, I, I wouldn't – I mean, it would be fantastic if you could, but it would be extremely expensive. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so just because of good old Willie Mays, but I love good old Willie. Yeah. Um, Let's hop into it. The week that was tops uh, last week's release is uh, tops living week seventy nine. Uh, we had card two thirty five. Mike Piazza, Hall of Fame catcher, the New York Mets, sold sixteen shy of three thousand. Card two thirty six. Pablo Martinez, rookie pitcher, of the Miami Marlins, slightly over twenty three hundred. And card two eighty seven. Travis Denard, Darno. catcher, for the, Darno, whatever. Darno, get a real name. Uh, catcher for the Rays sold 2280, which is second to last place to Stephen Piscotti, who's still holding up the rear. Uh, check out at Tops Living Stat for full breakdown of where these cards fall respectively in the set and by team and by position. Uh, we also had 2019 Tops Archive snapshots drop, 2019 Panini Black Football, two online products. Uh, and we also had 1819 Upper Deck Premier Hockey and 2019 Panini Spectra Football. Came out on Friday the 13th. Spooky. Hot off the press is this week's releases. Tops Living Week 80. Garbage Fire Week. Uh, card 238. Yasiel Puig, outfielder, Cleveland Indians. 239. Brian Reynolds, rookie outfielder for the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates. And card 240. Felix Hernandez, pitcher, Seattle Mariners. Now, the Mariners have two cards within three weeks. Yeah, we don't have a George Brett card. Or many other Hall of Famers. Yet we get two Yasiel Puig cards. So, how? 
two, two, two minor complaints. Probably not the best week to have a Pittsburgh Pirate. Oh, at least it wasn't Felipe Lo- What's his name? And uh, Velasquez. But uh, is it just me or does Felix Hernandez's face just seem slightly oval? Well, somebody said it looked like he just went on a three-day bender in Vegas and didn't sleep. <laughs> that too. So that has to be one of the worst pictures to have chosen as a stock image. Is it worse than the Rizzo card? Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, Rizzo just looked like a bad drawing. Unfortunately, this one just looks like, I mean, this is spot on. I'm sure it this, looks just like the picture. It's just, this is a mug shot of, hey, I got arrested for DUI last night. Right. I mean, I, I seriously, if I was the artist, I'd be like, no, I'm not going to draw that one. Yeah. And, and how about the, the uh, Adam Eaton from a couple weeks ago where he looked like he was like 300 pounds and he even complained about it? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was not very favorable. No. Matter of fact, but, it's the headshot on baseball reference. Uh, uh, you know, we got, we got two Puigs to go with our two Machados. I'm, I'm happy. And it changed the smile. Yeah, it's it's close. <laughs> no, I'm just it's stupid. I, I don't want to get into why he's got two cards. Why I there are so many great players to pull from, and there's not a vet there's not a veteran or I mean sorry, a retired star uh, on here. You know, uh, and you couldn't you couldn't go back in, into that. I mean, last week we had Piazza. The week before was Dion. The week before that, Bernie Williams. You have to go back to the to the terrible week of Stroman, Solar, and Paddock. Right. I don't know. It's just frustrating. Yeah. Well, you know, no, yeah, I get into it with my dad all the time about tops now, and and we've talked about that plenty of times here on the show. Uh, the no rhyme or reason as to why they choose this that or the other thing. And I, I would be curious to know how they choose these tops living cards. Cause it just doesn't really well, seem like there's any, any rhyme or reason to it at all. Uncle Rich said, because he's a free agent of the season. So it might be use it or lose it for him. But I mean, yeah, he was also a red too. So I don't, I don't know. It's just, so why um, not make him as, why, yeah, why not make him as a red? I just, it's, ugh. I want to move on. Cause I'm just going to get upset. Um, and these these dwindling numbers. Oh, and then real quick about tops now. How did they screw Kyle Lewis out of his uh, major league debut where he had a home run? And how does that not get a tops now card? Then why even have tops now? I'm not even a Mariners yeah. fan. I'm not even a Kyle Lewis fan. I just I want to know like uh, how 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 why 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 didn't that happen? So I, I haven't been following all along. H- have all the teams got a tops now card for breaking their franchise record since there have been so many? I, I, I know the Twins did. I'm not sure about the rest. I, I haven't yeah, bought the, the Twins are breaking the major league record. Right. I haven't bought a Topps Living card since 2018. So, so because I, I know a couple of teams had. I know the A's did not. Um, you know, Correa got the 100, 100th home run. Simeon didn't. It's just like, why are you picking and choosing certain milestones for certain players and not other guys? Um, I mean, does it just come down to the fact that the Astros players are going to sell 500 copies and an A's is only going to get 170. So it doesn't, doesn't make it worth their time. It, it just, the inconsistencies are tremendous. Yeah, it's just, I, yes. Uh, anyway, the, as much as I love tops living, it's starting to get a tad frustrating. It needs to no longer be living. Hey, oh, hey, oh, I, I love the set, but it, it's it, it's it just yeah. I mean, we've talked. Where, where's it. the Mike Uskrimski? Next week, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Well, and that'd be perfect to have a Mike, Mike and and Carl in the same week. Correct, correct. We were talking but about that show. I mean, uh, there's tops now to commemorate it. Yeah, there'll be one tomorrow. Hopefully, with the first pitch that Carl threw out to Mike tonight. So we'll see. Right. Uh, 2019 Bowman. Chrome drop today. You have two versions. You have the hobby version and the HD choice. So the hobby version is going to run you about $147 a box, 12 packs per box, five cards per pack. Now those 12 packs are broken up to too many boxes. Um, your box break is uh, two autographs, one elite farmhand and one shimmer parallel. Now, so 
a uh, little PSA real quick. I saw a man, I saw a guy open a case today live in front of me. Uh, and then I also saw Mojo open some uh, cases today. Uh, the third pack in every mini box is where the auto is. So if you're going to buy Chrome, buy it as a sealed box of two minis or buy a sealed mini. Do not buy loose packs of Bowman Chrome. Just letting you guys know right now. Don't buy any packs of Bowman Chrome. You, 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 know, you know, it's funny is I, I've seen a few people on Twitter already saying, hey, I got so-and-so or I got such and such. And I'm just like, who are these guys? Yeah, I mean, there's I, I t- the only guy I know of that's in there that people have been looking for is Seth Beer because he had a Mojo Green uh, Mojo Refractor in um, in the uh, Mega Boxes, and that was where his first autos were. Uh, he, he, is he a member of the Diamondbacks? No, he is. Yeah, he, but he's in an Astros uniform. That's why. Yeah. So it, no. It, so the Bowman Chrome is still an Astro. Yes, because yeah. it's on card. So. I mean, he was traded so the maybe, and the cards were already made, you know. No, I, I, I get I get the semantics or the, you know, the particular variables of it. But to, to me, it makes it less desirable because if I'm a Diamondback fan, I don't necessarily want it. And if I'm an Astro fan, I don't necessarily want it. Yeah. So re- really, then it just comes down to I'm a prospector and yeah. I want it. Yeah. Tim Tebow's first Bowman are in there. Uh, they also have the HTA Choice, which is $185 a box. You're going to get one pack, three cards per pack, and they're all autographs. Um, there's a, it's a hundred card base set with a 50 rookie short print image of variations, which I believe Ben and when I were talking, I think that's new this year. There's also a hundred card prospect set. Bowman Chrome prospect cards are on card or the autographs are on card signatures. Uh, there's also a 2019 fall league, uh, Arizona fall league relic uh, set. And, uh, so Bowman's not normally have relics in it, but they do have a relic set in here. Some have autographs. Uh, there's an eight hobby. There's eight parallels in hobby, but in the HTA there's six more. Uh, is okay, T- time out real quick. We 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 see HTA thrown out a, a lot. Do you mm-hmm. want to explain what that is for anybody out there that doesn't know exactly what HTA stands for? Yes, yeah, it's home team advantage. It was something where they I know they were tagging boxes to differentiate them from retail, and like hobby stores got were listed as an HTA store as being a home team store. Sure. Um, and so that's what that means. Yeah. So just for anybody out there that doesn't know, because I, you see, you know, Ryan, Ryan Cracknell tweeted about it today. Um, there's quite a few people that have thrown out HTA and, you know, yeah, first off the line, there's other, other acronyms out there that a lot of people throw around that maybe not everybody understands or is familiar with. Yeah, there, a few guys I've heard to look for. There's a guy on the Diamondbacks with the last name of Perdomo. There's Marte with the Mariners. Um, there's a oh, there's a guy for the Blue Jays. His initials are his first name begins with the No. I think it's like Martinez or something. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know more about these. I'm trying to do some research. Um, I'm trying to watch some three day auctions on some of the, these players because we'll know a lot more going into next week. Uh, so, you know, so Chrome's I, out there, and, and, and the guy that was opening the Chrome case was a basketball collector, and he's like, you know, I, I started dabbling a little bit into baseball, and he was, I'm just kind of only collecting Bowman, uh, because he's like, I like rookie cards, and he goes, I like, I like to follow guys' careers, and they said, okay, you know, that that makes sense, and you know, he's like, what I do is I open them, and he goes, you know, I store all the autographs away, and I, I let them sit there for a couple years, and every once in a while, I'll go through and see if there's anybody that's that's made it. And so, he, but he was asking me the differences between Bowman, Bowman Chrome, and and Bowman Draft. And you know, I think we've talked about this before, uh, where Bowman Bowman that comes out in what like April, right. typ- typically is has the the second pick in the previous year's draft. So this year was Joey Bart from the eighteen draft, and then it's going to have a handful of minor leaguers that uh, are up and comers that haven't had their first Bowman yet, and those guys will be in there. Plus some. St- some well-known prospects will have a second or third or fourth Bowman card, depending on how long they've been in the, the minors. And then you have Chrome come out. And the and the prospects in this are mostly international prospects. A lot of these guys are 17 to what, 20 years old. They're young so, kids. Yeah. And uh, they're going to be names you haven't really heard of, and you're going to be waiting on them. And then you have Bowman Draft, which is going to be a lot of the first-rounders and the big names from that year's draft class. So 2019's draft class will be in Bowman draft coming out uh, later this year so 
And one thing to note, I, usually if they're going to recycle the technology, they will reset the numbers. So because Bowman also has a Chrome prospect set, the Bowman Chrome, the set, also has a prospect set. And then draft as well. And the same. But it looks like they did one, one through 150 in Bowman and then 150 through... 250 in Bowman Chrome, and I would yeah. assume they'll probably do 251 to 350. Yeah, and, and I like I like when they do that. It makes them a lot easier, especially when you're trying to to sure. sort them. Now, I, I've heard a lot of this going once the checklist dropped. That that overall, it's a very weak checklist, and a lot of prospectors have said kind of hold back. You know, when, when Bowman came out, we kind of knew that Franco and Joey Bart were going to be the guys. That everybody we're gonna be be hopping all over and and we're gonna have extremely high resale values. Uh, I've heard from a lot of different people uh, who know a lot more about this than than I do. Um, said that just kind of sit back a little bit on this. We'll kind of wait and see what the market does over the next seven to ten days before you just hop out there and start paying first off the line prices. Um, some of the stuff might might depreciate in the short term before it appreciates in the long term. And the one thing I can say about Bowman, if, if you're not sure and you buy it and you open it and you want to do that, just tuck it away. Don't sell it. Let it sit there. Let it sit yeah. there. Like a, like a, think of it as Bowman as wine. Let it sit there. Let it mature. Let the guys move up. And don't don't be too hesitant. I mean, you're probably, you might move, miss out on a few dollars, but you also might have something that comes through and surprises you. And, um, you know, so that that's my my advice. Uh, if you're going to collect Bowman, is collect it and hold on to it, and uh, and wait and see, and check back at the spring training every year, and just kind of see if any of those guys are popping. It's always fun to go through. We're going to talk about um, some fines later in the yeah, show. So, I say, is that a bit of foreshadowing? Maybe a little bit. Uh, we also had 2019 Panini XR football drop this week. Uh, it's um, 130 a box, two packs per box, about seven cards per pack. You're going to get one rookie autograph memorabilia card, one additional autograph, a triple swatch or jumbo swatch material or memorabilia card, one insert and four parallels. Um, XR is a hit heavy product that averages one of a kind autograph patch cards in every hobby case. Panini describes the cards construction of being sleek, dull holographic card stock. Um, New for 2019 is the Rookie XL Autograph Swatches. Memorabilia on these cards are displayed with a die-cut window in the shape of an X. And per Ryan Cracknell, there are only 3,927 one-of-ones in this product. Panini used a variety of memorabilia types to, to get all of those one-of-ones. Team logo patches, Nike logos, NFL shields, footballs, gloves, cleats, and... Draft caps. So there's only like 4,000 one of ones. Well, it, you know, it, it was a light week for them. Jesus. What? Isn't that just making a joke of one of ones? Kind of. Well, it, it was our friend Chris Young, uh, Chef Chris, who's a great follow, the Ramon Laureano super collector. Oh, um, it, it, we'll talk about that later. No, 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 no. So, something else. This okay. is retroactive. Um, he had made a comment about Panini Immaculate. And he's like, there were like 42 one of ones of just Loriano. And I'm like, he's like, I, I couldn't collect all of these, you know, if I wanted to, not even financially, you know, just being able to find them all. Um, you know, it was one thing when there was, you know, the Super Fractor and then four printing plates. So technically there are five one of ones if you count printing plates as, as one of ones in the traditional sense. But now you're just having one of ones of everything. It's like, this is ridiculous. You don't need 42 one of ones of the same player any more than you need 4,000 one of ones in a, per, in, in a given product. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. Oh, all right, we also have 2019 Panini Flawless Collegiate Football. It's about $1,300 a box, one pack per box, 10 cards per pack. You're going to receive six autographs, two MIM cards, and two gem cards. Uh, it's a collegiate lux luxury level release. Um, all the cards or all the autographs in the product are numbered to 25 or less. Rookie patch uh, autos are the, are the main chase cards in the product. 
and the parallels will have conference uh, logos, bowl game logos, and brand logos in them. Uh, flawless gym rookie cards, auto, rookie autograph cards are numbered to 25 or less. And um, it's just not rookies that have autographs in the product. There's also a flawless signatures uh, that go into the with autos of uh, college starts from the past, like Bo Jackson and his Auburn uniforms. So I like that one, the duel with uh, Kyler and, and Baker. That's nice. Yeah, I mean, not – do you, have, do you have Heisman Trophy winners from the same school to play the same position that one replaced the other, and they both were back-to-back number one picks? Uh, that's a very interesting situation. And uh, so it's kind of a that, – that card's like – I'm not an Oklahoma fan nor my uh, collector of either of these two guys, but if I came across this card or I pulled this card, it was like, oh, that'd be cool to have, just based on kind of what it stands for. Yeah, uh, Panini's had qu- uh, quite a few duels, both of, of- – you know, rookies, they, they've had different combinations of all of the, the top quarterbacks this year and in uh, a handful of different products. It, I have said this every week over the last couple of weeks, but Panini is, is killing it in football, you know, on a lot of fronts this year. They they are there. I mean, the, the, we, they have to, though. You have to have so many football releases. Right. So, yeah, but I mean, they're just they're doing a good job with a lot of their stuff. Um you know, not everything's perfect, of course, but there's a lot of stuff that's that's solid. And then next week, what's brewing next week's release is uh, we're going to have a busy week. So 2019 Panini Donruss Factory Football Factory sets drop. 2019 Panini National Treasures Baseball, which uh, they're going to have a first off the line of that, Tomorrow which will have two exclusive autograph purple parallels numbered to 12 or less in every box. And it drops what, tomorrow, Steph? Yep, tomorrow morning. Yep, so let's watch the site crash tomorrow. Um, we also have 2019 Tops Heritage Minor League, 1819 Upper Deck Clear Cut Hockey, 1920 Upper Deck Artifacts Hockey, and 2019 Panini Illusions Football. Oh. Sounds like a busy week, damn. It will be a very busy week. Uh, infield Chatter, a hobby talk section. Uh, Flick Chat. Guys, if you're not familiar with Flick Chat, um, so one of the guys that listens to the show actually works for the app and, and hit, it's been going back and forth and they refine some things. And so I joined, I had the show join or I made a show page this last week and uh, it's an app for, for podcasts to actually interact with their audience directly. And it's a great place to connect with everyone that enjoys our show or hates our show. I mean, hell, if you're watching and you will like us, let us know. Uh, but we're going to be, you'll be able to, we're going to be posting topics for feedback and, um, contest winners and we also want your questions so uh if you if there's stuff you want to talk to us uh, about or you want us to talk about on the show uh this just gives you another avenue versus twitter uh you can engage just in a smaller group uh and so just check out the flick on uh, the flick chat app in the store and search about the cards so i know steph joined and i joined yep i think ben did as well Okay. No, I I joined. I haven't used it yet, but uh, I'm excited. Yeah, and I haven't been super active in there. Um, I've just kind of been playing around with it lately. Um, and I know there's so many social media things. We tend to stick with Twitter. And we have the Facebook page, and you know we were you know this and that, and the website and the email and all this stuff. But uh, I just figure we might as hit. You know, I already had a few people hit me up through there, and uh, so just kind of see how it goes. And if it works, it works, and it doesn't, it doesn't. But I, I just thought we'd give it an opportunity. It uh, seemed like a really good idea. I've actually met some other podcasters uh, on the site, and I've been getting some information from them and kind of helping each other out too. So that's been fun. Uh, I think Steph sent this over to me, but I could be wrong. It could have been Ben. At Zoso56, Ryan Channels. Yeah, I think he's a local guy here, Ben. Uh, yeah, he's a Nat Nap area. Yeah, he tweeted out, finally completed my at Upper Deck Sports Yosemite NPS set from 2017, Goodwin Champions. All six cards are numbered to 90 or less, uh, are all numbered to 90. Yosemite holds a very special place in my heart life. So this set was has a special place in my PC. Such fun cards. And so he actually, if you go back, he went to all of the places that are listed on these Yosemite cards, the little maps that they had of the national parks, which I think is super cool. And you know who else thought it was cool? Who? Upper Deck. Of course. 
Oh, they're going to feature it on the blog. Sweet. So keep an eye out on that. Yeah, Ryan, way to go, bud. That's awesome. Yeah, he that. and his brother, uh, Justin, um, when when Mike Trout was in town last week, apparently he was at a, eating at a restaurant near where they were where they live, and somebody had alerted him, so he was able to go over. I don't know if it was Justin and Ryan or one or the other, but uh, they were able to run over and uh, had an opportunity to meet Mike while he was there at dinner. It's kind of neat. That's cool. And then, if I'm not mistaken, Mike uh, met him at the stadium and signed their uh, jersey the next day. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, it's kind of kind of neat. Who you know, it showed you. There's there certain people. I think we've all have stories. I think we've talked about our stories of of meeting celebrities or athletes, and you know, had good experiences, bad experiences. It's good when there's a superstar who is down to earth and is willing to do that for fans. Right. You know, after all, he's he's eating dinner. He doesn't have to do that. You know, he could have been like, hey, guys, right now is not the time or the place. Um, so to take some time out of his evening and uh, interact with fans is pretty cool. Very much so. I don't know who Mike Trout is. What about Sidney Crosby? Oh, yeah. Sidney Crosby. He's the, he's the receiver for the Vikings that was always hurt. Yes. No, that's Anthony Carter. Well, Sidney uh, Crosby. Per- Per- Percy Hav- Harvin. Oh, that as well. Crosby, so, he's the one that plays for the Capitals, right? Uh, he wishes. Uh, they got a pretty. They got a pretty good one there. Let, let's not. Uh, uh, you OB. know, Ovechkin is pretty good. Kobe is. Steps over there, clicking away. So, we talked about in in this. I follow this this. Guy and he follows me and, and I just want to point this out because I just I couldn't believe we talked about this before. It's at Brew Crew Deer uh, four one four uh, tweeted out lot recently that um, you know he bought some Bowman or two two Chrome blasters and got Jack and he goes let's just say this I'm done buying any I'm done with retail done buying any boxes contemplating done with cards this is just a waste of money not one numbered card for the second time it's pathetic we spoke about and i said we spoke about this a few weeks ago he's upset with two tops chrome blasters that he bought he this one was two tops chrome blasters in a contenders box of draft picks for football blaster and I, and i my thing is was with five blasters you could have picked up a hobby chrome box the same price pulled two autos gotten a handful of parallels because these are these are retail boxes they're not. They don't guarantee a dick. It's almost except, for that, you're, except like, for that you're going to get an X number amount of cards. It's almost like that's why we should have the checklist with the ratios, so that you know what retail odds are. I mean, I, I can't speak because uh, th- this week we bought three of the fat five ninety nine nine ninety nine packs discounted and pulled an auto out of Topps Chrome. Now some scrub relief picture out of. Colorado, Baltimore. I didn't, n- n- nobody cares. Nobody's ever heard of him. But uh, it, it, I knew going in that I wasn't going to have an odds at anything. And I, and I think that uh, if you go on knowing that, the occasional purchase is fine. But what do you but, think? Yeah. You it's, should know not to expect a whiny kid like, I didn't get what I wanted. Well, go spend the $60 and buy what you wanted. You see, but you go on Facebook – and in your, you're in one of those groups and you always see, oh, you guys say that retail's bad. Look what I hit out of retail. It's like, first off, you're one guy in a group of 40,000 collectors. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. You, you, you beat the odds. Not only did you beat the odds, you beat the odds that are ridiculously against you. Because most blasters are going to have nothing unless they, they're one of the ones that have like a, you know, pack of of you know retail exclusive parallels or a manufactured patch or something along those lines that Topps flagship have had in the past you know but you 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 scroll through facebook enough and you're you see 10 or 12 of these posts and all of a sudden you think i can do that i'm going to go get a blaster you, you know blasters are or blasters are, are are for you to open something when you're buying $100 worth of groceries at walmart you want to you want to these like yeah that's it. that's all it is it's not to collect you know, yeah, if you get something cool, but 
as a general rule of thumb, retail is bad, bad odds, regardless of what Facebook groups will lead you to believe. If you're, if you're looking for hits and certain things like that. Now, if you're looking for base cards and help, you know, that and that's all you really care about, and you're looking for some rookie cards, hey, it's worth a shot. You know, but besides that, that's that's all they're good for. And don't eat, don't eat, like what are your expectations? So say he had say he pulled the autograph of the relief pitcher that Steph pulled. His reaction would be, I pulled a crappy auto. Right. Well, Which the, the fact you that you Mike pulled an Trout auto at all. In every, in every hobby box. You want Mike Trout autos in every retail box. So, and you know what? Hey, but that box is $300. Yeah. Can I say something that's kind of a one off of this conversation? Because I made a comment the other day. I, I don't remember who, who had said something about being done buying. I don't think it was, was this guy. Somebody had said that they were done buying because there's not enough in there for them just buying boxes in general. And I had made a comment about, you know, my personal, I, I think it was uh, uh, the wax heaven, uh, Mario, who had made a comment about in response to that person saying, um, since he stopped buying boxes and opening packs, his, his collection has been so much better. And I said, mine as well for any true collector. Uh, I don't think there's enough value in opening packs and boxes. And I had a couple people respond like, true collector almost like they were offended by it because they probably open and i just wanted to clarify for anybody that saw that when i loosely use the word true collector it's more for people like myself that have extremely specific and defined and focused pcs as opposed to people that collect more in general and have more of an open collection we're all true collectors it's just the, the word true probably bothers some people when I use that in, in those terms. And, and this is one of those things that for me, for you guys, buying blasters is more fun, something to do. It's not supposed to be for, well, I I'm an ace collector and I need to open this and get all my A's out of it. Yeah. I'm wasting 20 bucks. If that's how I'm looking at it. Yeah. No, in foul ball five, uh, foul five ball says I have a great luck buying retail targets as LCS. So cool. That, that does happen. If that's your luck, then awesome. I mean, I think the best pull I've ever had out of retail uh, was a couple years ago. Uh, I think it was last year. My wife bought a box of archives with me, or I had her pick it out, and it had a Sandlot autograph in it, squints. Yeah. But it was like a $2,500 pack odds that I would get one. So you, like that was like in a ridiculous amount of, of blasters to be able to, to get one of those. Ty Buttry. Yeah. Of the yeah. Angels. Oh, former prospect of the Red Sox. Indeed. You know, so, to be honest, that was like three. I did the math. That'd be almost 312 boxes of uh, blaster boxes to pull one Sandlot on it. That's ridiculous. Uh, and there's nothing, to speak to Foul Ball's point, there's nothing wrong with buying retail. No. It's a good part of the, it's a good part of the hobby. It's a necessary part of the hobby because. There are a lot of collectors geographically that don't have LCSs available to them. It's just one of those things that curb your expectations. If you buy three boxes for 60 bucks, understand your odds of getting something and getting something good at that are, are much, much lower. That's, that's basically the point of this. Yeah. No, it's, it's just, it's just, anyway, you kind of get what you pay for a little bit, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. So that's why hobby boxes are more expensive because you're going, there's certain guarantees that you're going to get in there. So um, Bowman next. Um, so Tops, and they're in infinite wisdom, has a more online product you can buy. Um, an exclusive to tops.com, the print to order for uh, format highlights top minor league prospects from all six Arizona Fall League teams. 2019 Bowman next. AFL Arizona Fall League baseball is issued by team. Each team has a 10 card base set available for $30. The cards are going to be sold for 43 days, ending just before the AFL championship game on October 26th, which is also the next card show in Sacramento. Uh, done in the same vein as Tops Now Road to opening day sets, uh, the release has an extended selling period for base sets and autograph. Editions. So there was autograph editions, and I think they're like a hundred bucks. I don't remember stuff. What are the autograph ones? Uh, eighty bucks. Uh, yeah, eighty. So some of the some of the guys to look for that are going to be in these, and and we there's a I put a link in the thing if you want to. Yep. So um, 
this is the rosters of the team, so you can find out. But that was provided by Major League Baseball. But Joe Adele of the Angels is going to be in here. Royce Lewis and Alex Karoloff of the Twins. Forrest Whitley of the Astros. Joey Bart of the Giants. Jared Kalenic of the Mariners. And Alex Baum of the Phillies are some of the bigger names in this that uh, people know of that are going to have a cards in here. So, but uh, we, we, we have and, a uh, top living stat might might i haven't talked to him specifically he might have some singles available uh so if there's any specific player you're you're interested in without buying the whole set you might want to contact him and see what he might have available because i know he was planning on buying some of this as well yeah um there we go some more print order stuff yeah and now it's bowman i mean why not why not just do it all why, why even have hobby and retail do it all online now. Yeah. Don't let them hear you say that. Well, if they're listening, hey, just keep it coming. We can't get enough. Obviously, by the under 3,000 sold this week. All right. Uh, so our buddy Dub, I, I tweeted out like, hey, what do you guys want us to talk about on the show this week? And so our, our buddy Joe Joey Dub at Dub Dubbentality said, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the current discussion of the Loriano relic that is happening. I'll tag you. It's a bigger discussion about relics, but great example. So he tags us uh, in a tweet for Chef Chris, 49er, our buddy Chef Chris. Love Chris. Um, still trying to figure out what Ramon wears. Trying to figure out what Ramon wears that five, that is 5XL. Any ideas? I think Against- they found Ben's jersey. <laughs> I mean, uh, bro, I don't even wear five XL. I'm a big dude, <laughs> right? He, he, he tongue in cheek uh, tagged uh, a good friend of mine, Sandlot four hundred eight, who's a big Loriano guy. Makes all the posters. If you watch an A's game and you see the the posters out in the outfield, uh, Brian makes all of those. He he wears a pin jacket. Uh, Brian's a really neat dude, and uh, I think Brian is secretly in love with Loriano. So, um, oh, go ahead. You know, I was just gonna say that you know, obviously a five XL. The the jokes are abound as to what possibly he could have. It would be a five XL. But come on. Well, well uh, we have a, a Sherlock Holmes among us. So Jonathan Hoover tweeted out: Google the RN number along with one hundred percent polyester, and you'll find majestic Oakland A's warm up jacket. Hope that helps. So he went to the picture uh, and actually found a, a jacket that would be similar to what, you know, from that from that information that he had off that little tag of the 5XL, what it was. And uh, it's of, of a 5XL warm-up jacket. My thing what? is, if first of all, Loriano is not pictured on the card anywhere. Nope. All the only thing you know it's a Loriano card is as his autograph on it and like a green stripe going across it. It wouldn't be the first time that you get all this this rated rookie crap and other stuff that e- either is or is not e- even remotely player worn or even was in the same room as a player. Event worn. Yeah. So it's just I, I don't I mean remember the Mark Ingram picture where he was wearing like seventy five jerseys at once, that shit was hilarious. And it's I understand really- why they have him wear like an extra like a like a five x jersey uh, at the rookie premiere stuff. Okay, they're gonna make more cards out of that one jersey, but in this case, like why use the five x tag? Are you that inept? You don't can't put two and two together. It just, it, yeah, it calls into question a, a lot of the validity of, well, everything, right? This is gonna, mean, this is a little foreshadowing, even more to a topic for later in the show. Foreshadowing the episode, yes, the but episode. yeah, that's a that's an ugly card. It's a sticker auto that has nothing to do with the player. And if you didn't have his name on there, I would recognize his auto because I collect A's and I own some of his autos. But if you cover it up, Loriano, and said, all right. Whose card is this? Well, five XL is going to be a big boy, isn't he? Is it Prince Fielder? No. You know, yeah. It's it's a, By the way, you the would start the vegetarian I've ever seen. 
I mean, and, and because it's green, you might say, well, is it is it an Oakland A? Do they have any larger fellows on their team? And, you know, not since Country Breakfast uh, was on the team a couple of years ago. Oh, he's another runner for uh, Ben Ben Wilson lookalikes. Billy oh, Butler. stop. Oh, <laughs> stop. We've already found the, the doppelganger. Oh, you got to find a picture of Billy Butler real quick without his hat on and his gear. Uh, uh, it's it, no, I, <laughs> just dumb. Uh, he, he he could be he could be one B, but M- Mensch will forever be one A. Oh, for sure. But it reminds me, it just takes me back to that upper deck set where they released all the sticker autographs and it was three sticker autographs on one card. Twenty twelve SB. <laughs> yeah, it just would like it would it'd be like Ricky Henderson they have a Ricky Henderson, and then would say like uh, Mark McGuire, and there's a Mark McGuire autograph, and then it would be Jose Canseco and Jose Canseco autograph. But it wasn't that; it was more like uh, Mike Gallego, Brent Gates. And Ron Hassey. I mean, that was the quality of player. I need that card. Or like for the Twins, it would have been like, um, you know, Alexi uh, Casilla, Nick Punto, and uh, Christian Guzman. Yeah. Hey, Nick Punto is an A's legend. So, you know, yeah, it'd be for the Royals, it's like Phil Hyatt, uh, Buddy Biancalana, and. all you know, right, Steph. You need to, Jermaine Die. Steph, you need to find me that Gallego Hassey Gates triple. Yeah. Here's the Tommy Hansen one. Tommy Hansen. There's a picture. There's a shadow, a silhouette of a picture, and it says Atlanta 2019. Tommy Hansen autograph. Didn't he didn't he die? He, yeah, I think so. When they had Here's that to death, yeah. Cleveland's Michael Brantley, Carlos Carrasco, Chen Chang Lee. And Chicago's is Ryan Flaherty, Brian Matt. Matus and Xavier Avery. Okay, Brian Matus was supposed to be a stud, and then uh, I don't know what happened there. So wasn't it Brian Mattis? I thought that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, name. maybe it was Mattis. It was one of the two. Right, he never made it, so take it out of my lexicon. Um, so we talked about uh, earlier, but uh, finding stashes. So over the past week on Twitter, I've seen a lot of collectors posting stashes they found while organizing or cleaning up collections. So, uh, Terejas Bisbal on Twitter. Sorry, my Spanish is terrible. Terejas even though I took, Bisbal. yeah, it took three years of it. Um, what a fine, uh, what a day to find this stash. And I thought I paid way too much when I bought them. Five dollars for the base, ten for the chrome, and now I think it was the, and now I think it was a great price. So remember, five dollars for the base, ten dollars for the chrome. Mike Trout, Bowman rookies. <laughs> Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen base, seven chrome. Yeah. So it brought to my question. This is one of many I've seen people just finding stuff, cleaning up. I mean, I've I've been finding some stuff around here lately uh, as I'm going through and organizing. It's like, oh wow, I didn't know I had that. Oh god, that's awesome. But what have you found in the past when you've cleaned up or organized your cards that you forgot you owned and were like, oh? That's cool. Related six trout rookies from 2011 update. So as, as I was breaking, I was like, well, I mean, uh, okay, hey, it's kind of a cool pose, whatever, tossed it in my rookies box. And like two, three years later, I went digging through it, looking for stuff. And it's like, oh, oh shit. Well, have you found anything, Ben? I know you, you, you know, keep everything pretty well put together, but. Yeah, I mean, a while back uh, when I was purging everything, I found a uh, Rivera Bowman rookie. Um, but I think the, probably the coolest find I had that I didn't know was uh, what year were the Deckles, Steph? 68, right? The Deckle Edge? Uh, 69. 60, 68. I thought 68, I think, right? Yeah, I think it's 67 or 68. And so I wanted to buy the whole set. And I was like, man, this is a real cool set. It's a, it's a, it's a condensed set. I think there's only like uh, 40 of them or something like that, give or take a little bit, 35, 45, somewhere in there. And as I was going through all the stuff that I had growing up, lo and behold, I have almost the complete set. I was literally missing like two guys, Pete Rose and uh, one guy that I believe had an error. So he was a little – he wasn't a big name. Jim he Wynn, one, boy. Yeah, he was one of the, the – um, 
the lesser names on the checklist because it was all big names. Right. And uh, so I think I'm missing two cards for the whole set. So I just thought that was kind of neat to have. I know it's not necessarily finding a stack of trouts, but for something that I was looking to invest in and, and buy, already having it was kind of cool. Yeah, Kevin Jones came. I found a near complete set of 64 tops, Giants cards, pretty fun. Just need the main yeah, like, Koufax now. It, it's always exciting if it's something that you would want to PC. I mean, obviously, if it's something that you can can flip, that's neat too. But you know, yeah. my, my favorite was in um, spring training at seventeen. I was going through and cleaning up cards. It's going through my autograph box, and I found a fourteen uh, Bowman Chrome first auto of Aaron Judge, and. Uh, I had it out for 150 and somebody offered me 125 and I said no. And then I sold it about uh, six or seven weeks later for $850. So that was fun. That was a good find. So. Yeah, I think Aaron Judge caught a lot of people. Uh, yeah. I was you know, his rookie cards from Series 1 that year for a buck a piece all day long. Yeah. Yeah, and he, he's local. I, I, he grew up, um, I think, about 15... Yeah. Huh? Down, near, down near Fresno? No, he was closer. He's uh, down near uh, Clements. Um, I it was Linden. It. Was it Linden. Linden, there you go. Yeah, that, that, that's about, uh, shoot, about 10 minutes from where I work. What, yeah. like the corner of what was that again? I can't tell you that right now. Oh, okay. Police are probably... I, I, I'm in between corners at the moment. R r relatedly, I found one of these that I'd forgot about. Nice. Not graded, mind you, but uh, Aaron Judge, uh, 2013 Panini Prism, Perennial Draft Picks, uh, Red Auto to 100. That's sharp. Still have it? Yeah. yeah. Well, see, I figure if I'm going to do my grand home run plan that I haven't unveiled yet, I may as well have the autos of the all-time rookie home run record holders. And as I already have the person who McGuire broke his record, and I'm in the process of picking up a McGuire auto, I may as well hold on to Judge and eventually get Alonzo because yeah. I think Judge's record is about to fall any day now. Yeah. Um, so other finds. So this week, in my one of my buddies, Matt, came over and his father-in-law had found a, uh, a Ziploc bag full of, of smaller Ziploc bags full of uh, 70s football. And he brought them over to me to take a look and see if I could find anything. So I'm going through, like, I don't know there's 40 or 50 Ziploc bags, and they're pretty much broken out by team. And there were 10 to 12 cars in each little Ziploc. And it was a good, almost a complete set, I think, of 77 tops football. Uh, he's missing Walter and a couple other stars, but, you know, there are a lot of guard cards in there. I come across, as I'm going through the Bears pack, a bear, a, a uh, Walter Payton rookie card, nice. and just looking at the card now, three of the four corners were had like a, a tiny, like one had a little tiny, tiny crease, the other two had kind of a little ding. But besides that, the centering of the card was good, the fourth corner was great. It was just a sharp card to sit there and hold it in my hands. And so, I, I put in a magnetic, I also found a Gary Carter 75 tops rookie in there. And then a uh, league leader in rushes, rushing of uh, OJ and, and Walter. And then, I mean, there were some, um, you know, Terry Bradshaw and Stahlbach and some of those guys in there too. But I was really impressed. And so I told him, I was like, hey, go back to your father-in-law and, you know, let me know if he wants to sell the, uh, the Walter because I'm interested. So I'm hopefully that'll be able to come down this week and I'll be able to add a Peyton rookie to my PC. That has a good story. So. Um, Doug, a, how do you price cards that are in short print that you might not be able to find a, 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 a comparable item on eBay or Com C examples like cards numbered to 25 or less. So I know we, we've covered some of this a little bit before, but this is more of a specific question. Hey, I have cards and I'm a low numbered parallel card and I'm looking to, to get an idea of what the, the price would be, but how would you go about it if you can't find a comp on eBay or Com C? Well, we, we do have an article written up on our website right now on pricing low numbered cards. Um, and I believe that was kind of something that he had referenced as well, if I'm not mistaken, that he had read that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, if you want to look for, say, let's use Mike Trout since we were just talking about him. Uh, the, the best thing to do would be to look for any Mike Trout numbered similar to what you have. So let's say at a number 25, okay? Um, and then find a similar product. So you don't want to compare flagship to triple threads, for instance. You know, you want to make sure it's it's something that would be in a similar tier. So uh, overall. Museum. Yeah, museum and, and triple threads would be a fair, you know, if, if you know, um, National Treasures and Immaculate might be, you know, for non-licensed items. Flagship and opening day. Yeah, you find anything that would be comparable enough. If you can't find a Mike Trout that is numbered out of 25 that you would think is similar enough, look for another player. So in his case, you would look for other superstar players. Granted, he, he's one of a kind, but but look for, you know, Mookie Betts and, and Francisco Lindor and some of the other top 10 players, Bellinger, Yelts. Okay. Uh, Look at 2011 updates, uh, Anthony Rizzo. Yeah, find something that's close enough to, just to give you a guideline. That's all you're looking for is it doesn't have to be spot on. It just gives you a baseline to consider. Um, and then, you know, find something from that exact set. You know, if, if it's a triple threads and it's numbered out of nine, um, find another guy that, that's that's on that same portion of the checklist. And so really you're not, you're not always going to be able to find an exact comp. You're, you're just going to look for, I mean, well, that's why it's a comp. It's something that's comparable. Yeah. Uh, whether it be. Is, if you're looking to sell it, you know, throw it on eBay, put a crazy, what you think is a crazy price on it and see what happens in field offers. And, you know, you get a couple offers and you don't feel comfortable with the offers. You don't have to sell the card. But if you find an offer that comes through or some that they keep, you get a few offers and they're all the same price or right around the same price point, then you have a value of your card of what people are willing to pay for that card at that exact time and moment um, for you. So that also is an, a, an, another way to be able to do that. In, in the other day, and I don't know what the product was anymore. I don't have the tweet in front of me. So, But it, there was somebody on Twitter that had a one-of-one one, uh, Chris Bryant, Kyle Schwarber, dual auto. And, and uh, she's like, am I crazy to ask 650 um, and it's like, yeah, you, you probably are. And somebody responded, well, it's your card. So, you know, at the one-on-one, you dictate the price. And, and that is the biggest misnomer and fallacy. You don't dictate the price. You don't have to sell it because it's a one-of-one. One, but the market ultimately is going to dictate the selling price. Yeah. You as the seller will dictate the asking price. But understand everything has... A ceiling. There's a cap on everything. I, I give a good example. So every once in a while, I'll I'll go on to let it go or offer up or Craigslist and um, look for lots of cards. Somebody that's just trying to move a, an entire collection uh, of stuff. And a lot of times, it's people that buy storage lockers that are looking to to dump whatever they found. This guy had a bunch of. St- of monster boxes full of stuff and he had like a price point of 850 and just by the pictures i could tell you know what they were they were mostly 80s and 90s cards which i'm fine with going through and picking up to to return at you know uh to sell the card shot or the card shows that you know hopefully we'll be doing in the future but i, I went back and i said you know looking at this i said 850 is a crazy number and I, I threw in another number and he laughed and he goes yeah sure you can have it for that price on the on september 31st and I'm like, oh, okay. So, so we're really expecting you to get out of this 850. He's like, well, I, you know, at least 700. And he'd had it. I go, how long have you had it for sale? Well, I've had it for sale for six months. It's like, okay, keep holding on to. I said, hold on to it. Let me know when. Let me know to a year or two when you're still holding out for your 700 dollars. What you want to sell it for? Yeah. You know, I you know, I don't need it that bad. I was just, you know, bored and, uh, you know, hey, let's see what I can go spend 50 bucks on and come home with. So let's see. Yeah. And then there, there's that the people think you're, that's a whole different mindset. Those people think you're ripping them off. You know, I mean, there, there was, there was a local one here in town on a, a Babe Ruth that was like a, maybe a $5 card. And the guy kept asking for, I think, like a hundred. Oh, that's and, like that jackass third base card. Someone says, hey, you're a jackass. So yeah. that photo of uh, moments, few seconds after Jose was a 40-40, here's a picture of him on the base. It's very rare, $30,000. Yeah. 
Yes. I got an eBay notification just because I looked at that. Hey, just in case you wanted this, may, now's the time to bid. I'm like, yeah, let me point up the you know, 40, Yeah, so that guy's an, an ass hat, and I think Ben, you said he got blocked by him. I'm mean, trying to get blocked by him just because. Like, well, our, our our friend Fear the Deer and and Sean Hunter uh, on uh, Twitter, they were going back and forth, and he had a burner account or something. They had called them. Don't bully him, and it's like nobody is bullying him. First off, we're all grown adults, okay. And, and we're giving him very realistic valuations of his stuff that he, he shitty thinks, stupid cards and you know he he thinks that his cards are the greatest coming and we're we're being honest with him and then now it's just become a game because this guy seriously thinks they are what they are and I well, I don't know what I said the other day but I was trying to intentionally get blocked because that guy's a knucklehead and on all my Facebook feed it always says you should add Keith as a friend and I'm like no I don't think I will. Well, and, you know, at what point do you have to wonder if the guy's not just screwing around to screw around? Yeah. I, I think half of it's a troll or half he's just – I think I posted a meme of Ju- Judge Duty. Either you're playing stupid or you're just stupid. Like, so, anyway. Uh, from from, someone that, from I want to move on to someone that's a lot smarter than that jackass. Uh, from Sue's a, a cardboard problem. So, a second post and as many weeks. I'm very excited about this. So, um you need to follow her blog, uh, a cardboard, a cardboard problem. So, the title is, and I, and I pulled out some excerpts from this article. Um, trading cards, fake cards have no place in the hobby. Don't help them out. The reason I bring up fraud in the same post as a card show is I went to a show this weekend. Every month there's a show in Garfield, New Jersey, and it could be hit or miss. One dealer really missed. He had a table with cards laid. Uh, laid with a sign for $1 each. I peeked around, saw a number of Mets and Yankees and a few well-known players. Then I noticed the Aaron Judge cards. Uh, these cards are not official. Maybe calling them a fraud is a bit too far. But in, in this case, someone used a company's IP to create baseball cards that were never released from the card companies and they are using they are using the designs from. While the cards do say A-C-E-O on them, how many actually know what that is? That what that means? I had to Google it. It stands for Art Cards Editions ed- and Originals. There is a difference between creating commission cards, commissions, and custom cards for personal use. Once you step over the line and start mass producing and selling it, you owe someone else money. And then, in the case of the cards above, the people, the people, the people, the seller would owe money to would be. Uh, to our Aaron Judge for using his likeness, Upper Deck or Fleer, depending on the design that was ripped off, and MLE properties for using the team name and logos. Now imagine how you would feel if you bought a card and didn't realize uh, it wasn't released by one of the card companies until you got home. In this case, maybe you're only at about a dollar, but, but these cards shouldn't be on the market in the first place. Um, they're neat looking. And I get the part that say ACO. There's, she also brings up the lawsuit that Panini has against um, some dude that was making Zion rated rookie cards. And this also has the F face on the bat barrel of the 89 Fleer ACO reproduction card of Aaron Judge. So, um, what are your thoughts on ACO cards? Not my thing, obviously. Um, there was someone at the National who had an entire display case of people that weren't in the 52 top set, but they had cards produced of them. And yeah, they were cool. Um, and if we're looking to have a complete full-on master team set for the 52 Senators, why? Uh, I would look to buy, pick them up from him. However, they're not from my collection, and he had no bones about saying, hey, these aren't the 1952 top set. If you present them as that and someone still wants to buy them, that's on them. I, I, don't, I personally don't think that they're cool. I just don't. I mean, if you want to make them for yourself, cool. I just don't find why take the time to make a car that never existed of a player I just, I, I don't get it. Now, well, it's different than what Tanner's done. I saw that one with the McCutcheon um, uh, dreadlock. Right. And then McCutcheon signed it. That's that's different because that's a completely different, that's a, an original design that he came up with. He didn't copy anything from anybody else. 
So oh. what about uh, like Nick at Boss Brink or uh, Crack and Wax, where they take a design and do it akin to Tops now, but for their own specific team? But if they're going to they keep don't sell that's them. theirs, I don't care. Yeah, they don't sell them. They don't. They don't sell. Yeah, them. I, I just. I just don't. I, I've I don't, asked. I don't have room for them. Like I don't know. I've asked Nick multiple times what his printing process is, and he won't tell me. Uh-oh. even how to do it at a home for my own personal use. And that's all I would be doing it for would be to do what he does at home for me to put in a binder with all the rest of my ace cards. And he's like, no, nah, I'm good. Just because he doesn't want to cross that line, even though he knows, he knows me well enough to know that I wouldn't. Right. It's just, that's his process. And he's like, nah, you know, maybe someday. Um, but I, I do own some ACO cards. I, I've, I've got a couple of Consecos and Maguire's. Um, I, yeah, I don't pay more than a couple of bucks. Um, but it, I, I posted some one time as kind of a joke, kind of a tongue in cheek saying it was like an 84 tops and an 85 tops Conseco. And I was like, man, finally, after all these years, I finally found them. And I had a couple of people respond. I didn't even know those were made. That's the problem. I bought them as ACO cards. I know they're ACO cards. They're going to stay in my private collection forever, but what happens when somebody else doesn't know them as ACO and buys them as such, right? Well, It'd be that's... really easy for me to sell these now and say, hey, this is, you know, a, a prototype set. It's like all those backdoor cards. I forget what they call them. The ones that are like Bowman Crims that don't have the autos, the, the test ones or whatever. Right. Uh, that, that, you know, all oh, these test ones just didn't have the autograph. No, dude, you just printed those off. They're probably still warm from the printing. So yeah. one would hope that if uh, you, you were looking to purchase those, you'd have a resource, say maybe a book that had a whole bunch of catalog details and past sales uh, figures in it that you can consult to see if the card is actually legit or not. Yeah. You have one of those. Sure. A big book. Maybe a big book. Yeah. No, Maybe but the but, only reason to have one. That's the thing, though, is is you know I, I don't think Suze's point was an issue with the ACO cards as much as exactly why Panini is suing that that one right. collector guy that's making cards is these are IP. You know, it's 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 Fleer, it's Upper Deck, it's it's the likeness of of the player. You know, once you start to cross that line. That that's when the legality starts to blur. Yep. You know, and um, yeah. it, you know, like I said, I, I I own a couple, but you know, it, it's it, there's a fine line there between uh, what the seller does and what a buyer does. You know, and, and we we all own reprints or aged reprints and things, and when they're bought as such, fair enough, but if they're not clearly marked as reprints and ACOs, then there's your first problem. And then the second problem, of course, the bigger problem is, is if there was any trademark, you know, IP violations. Yeah. Right. Uh, so Kevin Jones posted a question earlier and I just kind of wanted to bring it in right now. Uh, what crop of modern hot ro- hot rookies and young players do you think will flame out and be the next Todd Zeal? a good question i mean kind of first off first first off todd Todd zeal did have a very respectable career yeah but he was like the next superstar catcher yeah i mean he did have a really good respectable career so baseball wise i I mean he he did okay he yeah he, he wasn't a hall of famer but he, he played for quite a few years, right? A dozen years or so. Yeah. One guy that um, brings to mind is Jason Hayward. Sure. You know, you remember how hot he was? Gordon Beckham. Yeah, Gordon Beckham. I mean, we're going back a few years. If we're trying to be more modern sure. in the last handful of years, you know, it could be a, um, a guy like Devers, and even though he's having a, a pretty good year. Uh, uh, Moncada. Moncada. Um, Pete Alonzo. You think Pete Alonzo? Uh, Maybe Judge. Look, look at it like this, right? Eugenio Suarez just hit his 48th home run today. 
Does that look like a guy that hits 48 home runs? You know, if, if baseball corrects whatever's going on with these baseballs in the next season or two, I mean, Pete Alonso is about to hit 50 home runs. He just tied McGuire for 49 as far as rookie records go, right? So he's, what, three away from Judge? Yeah. Does that feel like the most hollow 49 home runs you've ever seen hit? It's just like he could hit 26 and you'd be like, yeah, 26, 49, it's the same number. It just – in a year where everybody – I was talking to my well, dad the other day. Yeah. Soler's got 45 for the Royals. Yeah. you know. I was talking to my dad the other day, and the A's break the record. If you had told me at the start of the year the A's are going to break their franchise record and hit almost 250 home runs with a week and a half left, and then you follow that up and say, listen, Matt Olson's going to miss six weeks, and Chris Davis is going to hit 22. I'm going to call bullshit and say, hey, listen, where are you getting these home runs from? Who's hitting them? Right. Because if if you say that the A's are going to hit 250 this year, cool. Davis hit 52, and Olsen hit 45. And then you're going to tell me, no, Olsen's at 35, and Davis is at 22. Where are they coming from? Well, And that's indicative of every single player right now that's hitting 30 home runs. Yeah, And Kevin agrees with you on Alonzo. Um, my thing is, is the Giants, right? So how come the lead of the Giants is, is all still only in like the low tw- the low twenties? Yeah, that's that ballpark. That ballpark's a son of a gun to hit home runs in. Oh, but Bonds hit seventy three. The man was crushing home <laughs> runs. <laughs> that that's a giant asterisk. But what do you mean? I think Alon- Wait, hold on. What do you mean? He was juicing. Come on. <laughs> what, Dude, no, he, 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 yeah, he drank a lot of juice. He was yeah. a strong dude. He had to take his fluids. He it was, it was flavored. He he had a little yeah, extra. He likes, he likes grape. It was he had grape. extra sugar in the Kool Aid. So yeah, right he, now the the home run leader for the Giants didn't even start the season as a Giant. Kevin Pillar, twenty one. Mike Yaskrimski, twenty. Evan Longoria, nineteen. I met Eva Longoria. would have nineteen as well. Brandon Belt, seventeen. Pablo Sandoval, who's been out for a while, fourteen. My boy Buster has six home runs this year and 36 RBIs. I, 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 can't talk oh. about it. I, I think Pete Alonso will have a very nice career, a la Todd Zeal. Yeah, I think that, that when all is said and done a dozen years from now, we're going to look back and go, Alonso was a really good player. Um, I just don't think that, that he's going to be a guy a dozen years from now that's going to have 450 home runs. Maybe he's the new Dave Kingman, the new Mark McGuire. So, for what it's worth, Todd Zio played 16 seasons in the MLB. And on, like, 74 teams. There was a pretty good list, yeah. Yeah, but... Yeah, yeah, he played for he played for a few teams. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's, a, there's quite a few guys, I think, that we can all look and pinpoint and go... 11. Yeah, you know, well, like, like the talk right oh, now is about... He Eli played Manning. for 11 of the... Of what the twenty six teams that were existed or twenty eight teams? St. Louis, the Mets, the Rangers, the Dodgers, the Rockies, the Phillies, the Expos, the Cubs, the Yankees, the Marlins, and Baltimore. He was um okay, real quick. I didn't know he was a an Expo, nor on the Rockies. Uh, two thousand three with Montreal and two thousand two with the Rockies. <laughs> They had to make new teams. They had to bring in new teams just so he could have them all. He actually had 18 home runs with the Rockies in 2002 and 144 games played. Well, that's because he's playing Coors Field, dude. Right. Oh. It, this, this is the kind of thing is like, you know, the talk right now about Eli Manning and the Hall of Fame. When you watched Eli Manning for the last 15 years, did you ever look at him and say, man, we're watching a Hall of Famer? No. So when we look at players – in baseball, it, when we're comparing them back to a Todd Zeal, who was a good player. Uh, and obviously, you know, 16 years is nothing to scoff at, regardless of how many teams he played for. Octavio Dotel, Edwin Jackson. There's a reason that these guys kept getting jobs. And just, I mean, look at it. Does, does, when you're watching Pete Alonso play, just we're going to use him as an example. Do you Do you feel like, Five, six, seven years from now, we're going to be looking at a multi-time all-star. Man, this guy's on a trajectory to be in the Hall of Fame. For me, I don't see it. Yeah, I want to see. Yeah. I want to see year two and three. That's what yeah. I want to see. I'm, I'm going to leave it open, and um, 
and see the don't get me started on the Eli Hall of Fame. And then you talk about Super Bowls, it's like I don't give a shit how many super the guy he didn't win those super Bowl. anyway. I need we get out of get back to this. Uh so getting back in the hobby at Bud Nom, uh Bernard Nomberg, uh, who's who's been following the show for a while and, and uh tweets out some good stuff. Getting back into the hobby can be completely overwhelming for some. How about basic approaches to get started back into the hobby? Uh, maybe we've already covered this recently. So, you know, kind of, but not directly like this. So I just wanted some real quick basic steps um, that you would take to to kind of start your way in. And also to Wags, uh, 6817, D- Dave Wagner, to you know, what is the best way to figure out what to collect? Uh, I recently back in and my head is spinning. So these are, we're going to tie these two questions together. Um so what are some basic steps that you would do? I, I started out with decide what you'd like to collect, right? What sports, sport or sports do you like? Teams, players, are you going to be a set builder? Are you going to chase autographs? What do you like or do you think you'd want to collect? Am I off at that point? Is that a good starting point? Are you going to do vintage or current? Is maybe one I would add. Yeah, I've, I wrote a chapter in the book that I'm working on uh, about this very topic, and I, I think you hit it on the head. The first thing is probably the sport, you know, or, or multiple sports if that's going to be your thing. Yeah, what's the? You know, I'm going to be a, a hockey collector. All right, cool. I, you're going to collect hockey. Do you have a favorite team? Yes. And if, okay, Hartford Whalers. All They're right. Nice. So, oh, so you. <laughs> Let, let, let's say you're, you're a, a football collector and, and you want to collect the, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Okay. Do you want to collect modern or do you want to collect vintage? Like Steph said, you know, are you going to be a Bradshaw guy? Are you going to be a Roethlisberger guy or are you going to be a both? Cause there's nothing wrong with collecting. I'm going to be all. a Mason Rudolph guy. You know, are you going to collect, do, do you want to collect team sets or do you want to collect complete sets? You know, you're going to kind of have to break it down step by step for what, you want, and then ultimately you're going to have to look at it from a budgetary standpoint. And yeah, go, that was much? my next thing: is set. I have a yeah. budget. What is your budget? Because if you're like, hey, I'm going to collect. I, I love football, and I'm going to collect all the the rookie quarterbacks. All right, good for you, but you you're going to have to have a different budget than if you're going to have. You know, if you're like, uh, hey, I'm going to go collect the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and I'm going to be a team set collector. And I'm just going to collect base and inserts. I don't need any autographs or relics. Well, that's going to cost you a heck of a lot less than if you're going to try to collect Kyler Murray and Daniel Jones and Drew Locke autographs on the heels of Darnold and Allen and Rosen. Yeah. And so maybe, it's, you know, hey, like I can afford to spend $200 a month on cards. That if I, if I had that $200 and it got lit on fire, uh, it wouldn't hurt, you know, hurt me. Um, also too, uh, Kevin says here in the chat, he's been super reactive tonight. I appreciate that quality over quantity is another thing to consider. Also to don't try to collect everything, you know, uh, at first you might want to dabble, you know, in breaks, like, um, do, do you want to buy into breaks or do you want to buy retail or you want to buy from a hobby shop? Um, you got to kind of find that out. And if you're not sure, try a little bit from everywhere just to kind of see your feel for it. And go from there. Ask questions. Reach out to guys like, you know, I mean, we're not the smartest dudes in the world. Um, but we've been doing this a while. And we, I think we have a pretty good understanding of, of what's going on. Ask sure. us questions. And if we don't have the answer, we're going to know somebody that will. There's tons of resources out there. Uh, Twitter's probably my favorite because you get such quick interaction. And you can interact with some people in some uh, positions that do this on a daily basis. That's their living. Um, you know, you have Beckett. Uh, you have Com C where you can get some, you know, you can start looking for stuff. Uh, CardboardConnection.com, tra- Trading Card Database, Baseball Cardpedia has great information. I absolutely stand by Trading Card DB. Yeah. Uh, oh, one, love those guys. I mean, super, super nice guy. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's what I use at work if I have a question on something. Yeah. I mean, so there's lots of resources out there. The biggest thing is, is don't, don't get overwhelmed. Take a minute, raise your hand, say, hey, I, I, I'm kind of lost. 
can someone help me out? And, and, and that's the thing is I think I've learned a lot just by asking others questions and uh, getting pointed in the right direction. And, and so that's what it's all about. It's a hobby because it's fun to do and um, it brings us all together. So, yeah, and there's two, two more follow up points. One, it's probably going to take you a while. You know, when, when I got back into the hobby in 2010, I've told this story that I, I wanted to collect it all like I had in 88 and 89. And you find out really quick that you're going to go broke. Yeah. So it, it's okay for it to take a while. It, it was it, getting back in in 2010. It wasn't until Topps Chrome came out in 2012 and really starting in 2013 that I decided I personally only want to collect A's cards and get every A's card I can get and I can afford it took me the better part of three years to get there. So that's okay. And it, it's okay to pivot your PC as new interests happen. Maybe not turn your PC over entirely, but it's okay to decide, Hey, I'm, I'm really want to focus on vintage more than modern. And even though I've invested a lot of time in modern and, and kind of, you know, I, our, our friend Ken Kinsley has decided to start to focus more on tobacco pre-war type yeah. stuff. And, and, and if, you, if you call Chris awesome. Torres, he's been in T206 like this starting this spring. I think he really got into it. Most and of yeah. That's why I've and, seen it post lately. That's awesome. And, and Chris is a guy that had, had been on the show and admitted he doesn't really collect anything specifically. He likes the Independence Day parallels from flagship. Uh, he's got a limited Mariners and all of a sudden now, you know, he's very active in the Facebook group, uh, tobacco row. Um, and he's even asked Ken, if you, if you move off some of the stuff that he'd be an interested buyer and, and that's a new passion for him. And that's really cool to see. So just kind of keep that in mind. It's okay to pivot your PC if a new interest comes. So it's okay um, if, to like somebody today that did you that you didn't like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I got him. Uh, got him. We're going to talk about that in a minute. As long as you're not prospecting. Yes. No, if if you have a, a new direction of, hey, you know what? What's really making me excited about this hobby is, hey, if you want to go from being a set collector to a prospector overnight, hey, that's your money. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but understand, yeah, the, the thing I always say on Twitter, if you follow me, you know this, is if you didn't want it yesterday, you don't want it today. Just because everybody else wants it today doesn't mean you want it. You only want it because everybody else wants it. You know, you're like the five-year-old toddler. I, I don't want that toy until my younger brother gets it. Now I have to have it. Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, I, I took me a couple years to get back to of, of really focusing. I knew I wanted to collect on all the Royals and stuff, but not until the last handful of years did I want to start collecting vintage sets like the top set, the 70s run. Uh, you know, I don't think I'll ever have enough – discretionary funds to go back into the 60s to build complete sets from the 60s but i'm happy with just doing this i was going to just do 79 through now and keep going which i have and i've completed 70 set eight and i've completed 77 and uh 70 there's like i think 75 is the closest i have out of the rest but 70 is pretty close too uh and i've really enjoyed doing that and it gives me a different thing after um you know working on my Royals and Giants and to go back and see these old players. And the fact that these cards are, you know, 40 to 50 years old and they still exist uh, is, is cool to me. So uh, Damon Heller at Damon Heller tweeted out the bet. What's the best way to sell, uh, to sell my whole collection and get out of the hobby. I'd love some tips. So, you know, depending on what you have, you know, your, your best thing is to, to sell your, I would say what to sell your highest end ones uh, individually uh, to recoup the most money and then, you know, anything base or um, generally available widespread to sell that in bulk and kind of sell it by the, you know, not by the pound, but, you know, like by the pound, like, hey, just this box is, you know, five bucks a box or whatever it happens to be. Uh, because, you know, if you wanted to take the time and piece it out, that's how you're going to make more money, but it's going to take a lot more time to do that than selling it whole like it is a whole big giant lot so well and then depending what you have uh you know if you have a bunch of 1990 tops for example the best place for that might be either looking for a charitable organization or a goodwill somewhere that you can 
donate them or, you know, with Halloween coming up uh, for those practice, package them up in packages, wait for kids to come by. Hey, here's two pieces of candy and 10, 20 cards. In my phone number. Um, you pitch for the Pirates? No. Um, so I thought that was good. So we talked about this a little earlier, and um, this was kind of a big discussion on Twitter the last couple of days. Uh, NFL quarterback prospecting, and, and Steph brought this up. A great time to do this would probably be the preseason, but with all the injuries, uh, with the injuries to Ben Roethlisberger, Drew Brees, Sam Darnold, uh, now Cam Newton, and the retirement of Lu- Andrew Luck, uh, there's some surprising starting quarterbacks right now in the NFL. Um, should you buy up undervalued backup quarterback cards before the season starts each year and let, na- let nature take its course? That was the question that Steph posed to us. Example, like, you know, this offseason would have been before Luck retired, Jacoby Brissett, Mason Rudolph, Teddy Bridgewater, Gard- Gardner Mitchell. Um, so, you know, is it one of those things like, hey, if you're going to spend a few bucks, is it worthwhile to – to gamble uh, on buying backup quarterbacks to guys that you might not think will make the season, or if they do get hurt, these cards might you know double or triple in value, and you can go buy something you really want. Yeah, I, I think it was. I think I brought it up because it was actually our friend James Kakowski who presented it to me, um, because he's been doing some prospecting and buying some stuff and and looking to kind of set it aside and. I, I had made a couple of comments about Mason Rudolph not being a guy that you should buy now. Now is not the time. Today is not the time to buy it. You should have bought it on Saturday, not on Monday. And James had brought that question to me and he said, hey, why not just buy all the Mason Rudolph type players now? Not not Daniel Jones, not Drew Locke, not players that are, are high draft picks that are, you know, number two guys, not like Kyler Murray who got drafted and automatically you're a starter, but, but guys that are high draft picks that you know are going to get opportunities. You know, Mason Rudolph's the Will Greer's of the world. Aren't those the guys that we should be looking at mm-hmm. buying now, setting aside, and then inevitably when an injury happens, yeah. then that's when. So here's, you know, here's a list of guys I came up with. Uh, Nick Mullins of the 49ers. He already he's already shown that he can play. Uh, Josh Rosen down in Miami. Jared Stidham in New England and Cooper Rush of the Cowboys. Yeah, I mean Nick, Nick Mullins is a guy that I think if I'm if I'm any quarterback needy team, you know if I'm if I'm Pittsburgh. Why wouldn't I have called San Francisco already? Unless you really think that Mason Rudolph Rudolph's is as good as Nick Mullins, and I would, I would probably tend to agree with that. If that's your guy, okay, I, I've got no problem with them being confident in him. Uh, but yeah, I think that's the kind of list that you should be looking at. Um, not first round picks. I mean, Josh Rosen's a little different because you see what's going on in Miami. Why would they give up a second round pick for him, other than the fact that? Miami must have thought that they can at least get that same value back for him next year. They're not even playing him, and they've traded away Tunsil. They've traded away Fitzpatrick. Why would you even bring Rosen in if, if he's not your potential starter? Yeah, I have a feeling he's not there next year either. He's going to be somewhere else, and he could be the starter wherever that might be. So I just – I think Miami gave up, even though he was undervalued as a second round pick in return. I think ultimately they overpaid because oh, yeah. now he's going to be looking at, you know, third team in three years. I don't care how high he was drafted. He's damaged goods as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, you know, if I'm a team like Carolina or somebody, or Tennessee, Tampa Bay, uh, I'll give you a fifth round pick. I'll, I'll take him, I'll take a look at him. But I'm not giving you anything higher. So why do you think collectors are picking Mason Rudolph up now? Just because he got the starting role in Pittsburgh for the year? Right right place at the right time. And and I, I, I was trolled a little bit by our friend Rich this week because Rich was was not favorable of a few things that I had said. More than you and know. And I tried to – I try, Huh? <laughs> More than you know. <laughs> um, he wrote it out I tried to explain it to Rich and he was not understanding it or was just aloof to it. 
But yes, this is a fluid hobby. The, the, the problem is, isn't that people all of a sudden want to collect Mason Rudolph now because he's the new flavor at Baskin Robbins. The problem is yesterday that flavor cost you $2 for a scoop and now it's costing you 20. If you want Mason Rudolph cards, fantastic. But most player, most people that already like Mason Rudolph have him. If you're a Steelers fan, if you're a fan of whatever college he went to, you already have him. The people that are buying him on Monday after the injury are only buying him because they're going to try to get a quick flip. The problem with that is you're buying at the height of the market or an escalating market. It's appreciating. And I'm not buying it at a dollar a piece. I'm buying him at $40 a piece. I bought, but I bought the problem is today. I bought these today for a dollar a piece. And that's a good deal. Right. I, I don't have a problem with, with the prospecting in, in its inception. That's why I say if you didn't want it yesterday, you don't want it today. Because yesterday it cost you a dollar. Today it's costing you a multiplier of X times whatever. Yeah. And a lot of times it's costing you hundreds of dollars. Yeah. Kevin Jones comes in. I, I lucked out with a ton of Rogers rookies because they because he sat on the bench buying far for three years. This stuff was so cheap in two thousand five. He was an afterthought and I was building my Packers team sets. Yeah, and then Chris Torres, now that everyone is buying backup quarterbacks, the key is to find the next position or player for cheap while everyone else goes for the backups. And that's true. And and the thing is, too, at this point in time, with these with the players that I named that went down, um, is the time to – like Sam Darnold, right? If he's out for the season, he was really hot going into it. This is going to bring a lot of people – they're going to kind of forget about him and maybe stop chasing him a little bit. A good time to slide in and buy. Now, you're still going to buy at a little higher end of the market, but that price is going to come down this next couple of weeks. You might you might be able to get yourself a 15 to 20 percent discount of what it was, uh, you know, pre week one of the NFL season. Uh, the more he the more time he sits out, people are going to kind of get nervous and need money to go out and buy, you know, their next their you know, uh, Luke Falk rookie cards. I mean, I've never seen like quarterbacks drop this quick in the NFL. I mean, I think it, it's crazy, but it's that. It, you know, one thing I had said to Rich as he was was going on his rant, saying this is what's great about the highs. You, you've been looking to buy a house. You've been saving up money, and all of a sudden, overnight, houses go from three hundred thousand dollars each to six hundred thousand. Today is not the day to decide, you know what? I'm going to go buy a house. Yesterday would have been really good at 300000 Today at 600000 not a good idea. It's a good time to say, you know, if this is something I really want, if I really need a Mason Rudolph card, if I really want to buy a home, let me wait out the market and see. Um, I did that with Matt Chapman a couple of years ago. And, now and that, that's okay. That, that happened to me with Matt Chapman. I did not buy his, his, his prospect card. Um, because he was a prospect and then all of a sudden he kind of came up in 17 and it was like well he's a defensive stud and and i'm like you know what i'm gonna wait till 2018 to buy it it cost me more money to buy it in 2018 than it would have before but i paid current market worth for an established player and an established market and not a prospect market buying at the height it, it, it's it's just tremendous that there are people out there uh, that, that don't have a problem with the hobby reacting this way and say, it's okay to go out there. And, you know, it's that old saying about a fool and his money will soon be parted. You, you can't do that. It's not sustainable. You cannot buy Mason Rudolph now any more than you could buy Jacoby Brissett when, when luck retired and the next one, when the next guy goes down. Yeah. yeah you I just, just can't. That, yeah. Just it. Interesting thoughts this week. So the last topic tonight before we head out uh, was we hit 90 minutes here. The the base rookie card is back in vogue. Uh, I'm going to actually be writing a piece this week on why I believe the base rookie card is back in vogue with collectors. Uh, a couple real quick highlights of it. You don't have to worry about fake or uh, auto pin autographs. You don't have to worry about mem pieces and where they're from. Uh, they're not a limited low print run. Everyone has an opportunity, opportunity to pull them from a pack. Uh, these were chase cards for collectors that are 30 plus as kids. And they also can be very budget friendly uh, via the packs uh, or even buying them uh, before the guy really hits and, and takes off. 
you know, the prime example is uh, Ronald Acuna cards. Uh, you know, you could buy them for a couple bucks, and now they're ten or twelve times even more than what they more than that than what they were. And I'm talking about flagship rookie cards. I'm talking about Topps Chrome rookie cards. I'm talking about Panini Prism uh, rookie cards. I'm talking about you know football like select football autographs. Um, some of the more base to entry level products. Those type of rookie cards that we all chased after. When you think I say like 83 tops, you know, automatically Sandberg, Gwynn, and Boggs come to your head. Frank Viola. Right. Who? Frank Viola. I don't know who that is. Um, Liar. He was a great pitcher for the Mets. Netted us some good prospects in trade. Yes. So did uh, – yeah. Uh, you guys did that twice to the Mets, by the way, with Johan and, and Frank Viola. Uh, uh, Johan, not so much, but yeah, they were still pretty good. Um, but no, so it's, it's gonna be talking about this and how I, so I've always been a huge rookie card collector, even as a kid. Like, I liked rookie cards and I thought they were cool. I continue to collect rookie cards. Um, I do like to collect a, a first Bowman of guys uh, before they hit if they, um, yeah, you know, I'll kind of go through like in the fall, in the winter, and look at some guys and try to pick up a full, a few first Bowmans of guys that might be top prospects the you know the following year. And uh, but I love the base rookie cards, and um, it's kind of really what else besides my Royals collection and my tops run of uh, flagship sets that the cards I collect. I could care less about autographs, to be honest. I can care less about mem cards. Um, I could care less about parallels and all that stuff. Um, you know, if I pull those and it's nice, I flip them and I take that and I go ahead and pick up more Royals and rookie cards or Giants cards. So Ed, the, Ed, Ed agrees with me, the, uh, you know, so I, I think everybody remembers the rookie card. Sure. You know, everybody knows and can point to it and talk about it, but everybody too actually has the opportunity to go out and buy a pack or cause you can get them from retail packs. You can get them from hobby packs. Uh, you can buy them all over online. Um, you know, they're accessible for everybody. So I think that or realizing that and going, you know what? Hey, I could have a handful of like five or six dollar cards that could value up to 10 or 12 or 50 dollars. Uh, and I know that, hey, it's an authentic card and um, I don't have to worry about the autograph being fake. I don't have to worry about the mem being fake, all this other stuff and the card being trimmed. Yeah. And it's exciting to see. For for the, as long as I've been in the hobby and 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 you know re, this the second coming of the hobby for me, you Tim as well, you know it's all been about hits. Even the young kids, if I'm not getting hits, I don't want it. And it's nice to see value in the base cards again, rookie yeah. cards and, and second year cards and uh, short prints and things. Even if there's a bubble, even if there's, you know, we could talk about the negative side of things that some of this stuff is selling for stupid prices, uh, market manipulation and whatnot, but it's nice to see interest in something outside of a hit. Yeah. I, I low number parallel. No number from, from series two up today for a buck, a dollar, you know, well, and I think that, you know, with the 37 parallels that each set seems mandated to have to drive product purchase, you know, the individual collector or the collector who doesn't want to be the supreme card nerd like we are is just going to look for what's the basic version that I can get for 50 cents, hold on, and hey, maybe it's four bucks down the road. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe I kind of like this guy, but... Uh, hold on to it. Maybe it becomes a side collection. I mean, the fan favorite, Williams Astadillo, is uh, in a Phillies rookie on his first Bowman card. Now, I don't necessarily want those because they're not twins, but they're him. So, yeah, I'll hold on to a few. Yeah. And they're iconic images. Well, and too, on top of that, you know, sometimes, like, I might not be a fan of, of, the, of the player – but they're going to be, you know, if I believe they're going to be a good player, I might tend to hoard them a little bit. And then if they do take off, then then I flip them. And I say I paid a dollar for the cards, right? And I sell them for five. Well, I made four bucks. So I can take that four dollars and go buy stuff that I truly, really love and want for my collection. Sure. And I build something nicer for myself. So, um, 
you know that that's the kind of way but I, there'll be more detail in this uh on this rookie card post uh, that'll be out hopefully i'll have it out by saturday um if i get some time tonight to write so no, and that, that's that's part of creating a self-sustaining hobby buying stuff you know again if, if we're just going to use mason rudolph because of his insane appreciation overnight you know if you were buying him for a buck or two because you thought that he was ultimately going to replace Roethlisberger at some point. Good for you. If you're buying them at $20, $30, $40, that's not how markets work. That that real quick, you have to look at the talent of the player. Sure. Sure. And had Mason Rudolph been valued by the NFL as a stud next stud quarterback, he would have been in the first round. We have seen, some terrible quarterbacks taken in the first round the NFL believed in. Not, sure. not rarely. If you go around all the NFL teams and and say all of their quarterbacks were healthy and you looked at all the teams, the 32 teams, majority of them, majority of the quarterbacks, I, I, and I, it might be a little different this year. I haven't done the numbers. I would say 75 to 80% of the starting quarterbacks, if everyone was healthy, were first round picks. Now, the examples off the top of my head, you have Derek Carr, who was a second rounder. Brady was a you know, famous sixth rounder. Um, you have Garoppolo, who was a second rounder. You know, Fitzpatrick was what, like a sixth or seventh rounder. But, you know, he's playing for a team that doesn't care. So, but you look at the rest of the teams, and Kirk Cousins was what, a third or fourth rounder. That Drew Brees was a second rounder. Second rounder, yeah. But the, I mean, you look a majority of those the quarterbacks though are first round picks, and if not top ten picks, right? So you got to kind of look at how the NFL saw him. If everybody in the NFL thought Mason Rudolph was going to be a stud, he would have been a first round pick no matter what. People always trade back up into the first round to get a first round quarterback. You know, yeah, you get fifth, fifth year now. Yeah. Bridgewater is one of those guys. The Vikings traded back up to pick him 32 overall. Had he not had that terrible knee injury, he would have been their, their starting quarterback. And I think they would have been better off with him than with Cousins, but that's just football. But, and then um, you get other guys like, like Brady Quinn and Johnny Manziel and things that teams happen to be with Cleveland Browns in both cases, traded back, back up into the later part of you know the first round. I think you were somewhere in there. And uh, him and Brandon Whedon both were selected at 22. You know, and, and they, they trade back up to, to get these guys because you get that extra option year, that extra fifth year. Um, but Lamar Jackson, Bridgewater, you know, it's, I'm not trying to pick on Mason Rudolph. He just happened to be the guy that Rich and I were going back and forth on. And Rich is like, what if he's the next Tom Brady? I'm like, then if he's the next Tom Brady, <laughs> you know, good luck to the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know, I, I hope he is. But you can't pay Tom Brady prices today because everybody is. Yeah. That's stupid. Well, well, you, you just you can't. Yeah, real quick, Tannehill's in. He's the backup in Tennessee this year. Uh, Kevin, I appreciate the, the little comments there tonight. Yeah. No, and the thing is, is Garden Minshew, he's a fifth-round pick. The man almost gave up football two years ago and ends up going to Washington State, breaking records. Fifth-round pick by the Jags. Now everybody's talking about him being the next Tom Brady. What about uh, Ivan's favorite, Blake Bortles? Yeah, I mean, he was a th- it, it, he's a backup in the, for the Rams now. But I'm saying, like he, but but an NFL team thought he was the third best player in the draft that year, right? Right? You know, so I understand that. That's like okay, you buy, it, but the good chance that they bust. But I'm just saying that a guy like Rudolph last year was the year to buy him if you thought of anything. But even NFL right. teams really didn't think he was all that 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 great. And that, that's why I always say, if you didn't want him yesterday, you don't today. The guys that wanted him yesterday already have him. Pittsburgh Steelers fans, Mason Rudolph fans I already it's have I different in baseball than it is in football or basketball. And the reason being is with the minor leagues. There are a lot of guys that, that watch major leagues that don't really follow the prospects or how the prospects come up or know of a prospect. And so when they do debut and, and, and come up, those guys that collect those teams are like, oh, I didn't know. I'm going to go out and grab some prospect cards. And even though they might later learn on that, um, I'm just, you know, so I'm just saying baseball can be a slightly different. Now, 
Uh, I, and I've used Matt, I've used Matt Chapman as an example. He's a guy that wasn't on the radar of a lot of A's fans. You know, we knew about his defense, but not necessarily his bat. He was overshadowed by other prospects in the system. And then he came up and kind of took the league by storm. And now all of a sudden, non-A's fans want him, and that's fine. But I'm gonna pay, I'm gonna pay for established pricing, not for prospect pricing. You know, the, the, I mean, we, we could talk about countless examples of that, but I think you're right. Minor leagues in baseball kind of set that aside as a one-off from football and basketball. Yeah. So just a very interesting discussion this week. Uh, guys, any final thoughts before we head out tonight? Not any I can think of. All right. Well, remember, we're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific. 10 Central. Uh, make sure to follow us and uh, make sure to subscribe and review our show on all platforms. You can always follow us on Twitter about the cards. You can always follow Ben at our trading cards. You can follow Steph at Junk Wax Twins. You can always follow me at Big Ship 79 Make sure to share your hobby stories, um, great polls, and send your questions our way. We appreciate each and every one of you. And thanks for those folks that uh, won prizes last week that have reached out. Uh, we will put the get those out to the mail shortly. Uh, if you haven't, uh, check into the first – if you didn't know you won, check in the first like 10 or 15 minutes of last week's show, episode 64, uh, and we go over the winners there. And just DM me or uh, DM us at About the Cards or me directly. And then, um, or you can email us about the cards pod at gmail.com. And uh, we'll, we'll get, get it out to you. Yeah. So, all right, guys. Awesome. Well, have a good one. And Ed, welcome. We appreciate you as well. Welcome and hang out the show tonight. We appreciate that. Yeah, you're. You're a new voice, but uh, we love to hear it, so keep it up. We appreciate you. And, guys, we'll see you all next week on About the Cards. See you. Talk to you guys then.